It's wonderful to be back in Canada. I started my postdoctoral fellowship in London, Ontario a few years ago, and, and uh, I visited Montreal many, many times. Now, humans are special. We try to exploit the world to our benefits. We try to externalize our functions, whether it's the body or the brain. We are very good at it. We are trying to supersede animals like the bird, and uh, a locomotive, and we are much better. But we have never made a horse. We have never made a bird. And I think we will never make a brain. We will make gadgets that will supersede human mind and the human brain in various aspects, in separation. So, the metaphors that we like to use has been with us all the time, because there are only two ways we can think. One is the Aristotelian logic. The second one is in metaphors. It is something like the brain has a general, generalization cap capability. For a brain, there is absolutely nothing new in this world. I cannot show you anything that you would say it doesn't exist, because you always say, hmm, E.T. is like. And anything is like, because you always ground something, the unknown, to the known. So now we have this metaphor and saying, oh, uh -huh. this is the face recognition system. It has many, many layers, and it does an extraordinary job. Now we have a other system, such as CNN or ANN, and it does a fantastic job, because it recognizes the things that we proposed to recognize. Now, this kind of thinking I call outside-in for the following reason. First of all, we didn't care about the brain for a long time. We cared about the soul, the psyche, the mind, and only eventually the brain. And then we had to explain why do we have the soul, where it, where it comes from, where the mind comes from, and why do we have this ability. And the answer is different depending on which religion, which society, which philosophy or framework you belong to. And then you can say that the brain is there to absorb the beauty of the world. The brain was given to us by gods to understand something about them and something about their creations. So the brains are for us, a machinery that allows us to learn about the good and the bad and choose. So the, the brains are getting all these inputs from the world and something inside deep will make the decision whether we will act or not. And this thing in the middle is the spooky stuff. It's because we don't exactly know how it happens and we call it by different names. But we just discussed it last night with a distinguished group of, uh, of uh, Montreal neuroscientists and scientists that if I apply for an NIH grant for free will, chances are low. But, but if I ask for decision making, a little bit higher. But it's the same exact thing. So this input-output or perception-action cycle doesn't really work. The alternative, and the one I'm proposing it, is that the brain is, his main function is maintain its own dynamic. Where is Joshua? Dynamical systems. This is what the main goal is. And the second goal is to generate an output, because if you generate an output, your survival is higher. And once you have a niche where the things are a little bit more complicated, then it's worth adding sensors to make this prediction or make this output effectiveness, if more effective. So perhaps the most fundamental goal after maintaining the dynamic of the system is to, the brains are there to predict the consequences of their actions. Now, this comes, of course, with different generalization. One is that uh, we, with one framework, we, we go from the specific. We have edges, we have uh, angles, and we have this and that, and we build up something from simplicity. And we build up a human face, probably from uh, those networks that uh, uh, put together in various ways. Uh, 
However, this is done by a machinery that is not inherently smart. A dish full with human brain cells is not smart at all. In fact, human organoids do what the tissue that I transplanted 30, 40 years ago with Anders Björklund and Rusty Gage, there's nothing else, just burst, pause, burst, pause, burst, pause, very boring patterns. They lack of a lot of things. But the most important thing is that they are not a brain. And Joshua again said that there is some spooky belong beyond what's happening in this computational aspect. There should be something else. And of course, that something else is that Paul Chizak already alluded to, that the brain becomes brain, but is embodied into a effector. You need an actuator that carries out something, and the consequences of the actions that were initiated by the brain will be perceived or detected by the brain. But it has to work in a particular niche. It doesn't work very well. Now, why is the previous work, or the, not the previous, the previous framework, which says that the brain is a passive device? It just has to be put into the scanner, or it has to be fixed when we are talking about Pavlov's dog, or today we fix the brain and we don't care about the output, we'll learn the beauty about the world. Uh, the reason for that is that the experiments that we are doing when we do the analogies is done in a tricky way because the experimenter is in a privileged situation. Only the experimenter can see what's going out there and what's going inside the brain. So the classical experiment, as you see the human and visual approach, that you show a, a visual pattern uh, and then you have a response, could it, be, it could be bold or unit firing and so on. So the experimenter knows and sees beautiful correlations and report it in wonderful journals, gets promotions, and then this is how it, we, we move forward. Now, there is a fundamental problem with this. The fundamental problem is there is no grounding. Neurons in V1 or even in the face region have no clue, absolutely no clue what they are seeing. All they know is that there are action potentials coming from upstream and they integrate the action potentials. The only way how neurons can know something or how a biological organism can know something is to compare it with something else. We need a second opinion. Now, where does this second opinion come from? The choice is not much. The only thing that I can come up with is action. So you can look at things differently. It says, uh -huh, what happens now is that there is an action. Could it be eye movement? And this is exactly the kind of things that visual researchers did it like. This is why they fix their eyes in all visual research. Uh, and then when you generate an action, something has to happen. Now, going back to the perception action, something comes out, decision making and output. But the brain is not organized in this way. The brain is organized in such a funny way that every single output that is generated, it sends a return envelope to the rest of the brain. It's called the corollary discharge. So the sensory systems are always informed that the brain generated an output and the changing world that the, that, that the receptors and the, uh, the different sensors are seeing is because of the action of the, of the, the actor. And this is the only way how you can have an agency, that you can have a feeling that I am the actor of my own actions. Now, there is nothing simpler to show that than this example. You can build the most complicated tissue culture with millions of sensors which are watching this thing and the question that a human can ask is, that, is this thing broken? But the moment you start moving it a little bit, the answer is there for free because your action is giving the answer. Now, this is a nice system, but this is the fundamental organization of the brain, generalized from insects all the way to humans, that there is always a report back from the action system, to the visual system, to the auditory system, and all the other areas in the brain. Not surprising to me, but surprising to the neuroscience community, a couple of years ago, barrages of papers were published reporting the 
unbelievable surprise to them that not only a few, but most of the neurons in V1 responded to movement. This is the reason. Okay, so this is a very important thing, and this is, I claim, now, maybe with time it will change, that AI is missing the agency. Does it matter? Probably doesn't. But if you would like to claim that it works like a brain, it does. So let's just think about how we proceed from here. We can imagine a simple organism such as this hypothetical one. It's simple, but it's intelligent because it can survive very well. And the, the, the definition of biological intelligence is survival. Now, this simple system can generate an output and the registering ability of the brain understands it and puts it in for future use. This very simple system is very effective in predicting the future at a short time scale and in a very simple niche where it lives. If you put a honeybee from, a, from one area to another area, its entire repertoire is pretty useless. Now, what happens over evolution is to make the brain a little bit more complicated and you keep adding loop after loop after loop and you add three side loops also. This is another thing that AI can think about. It is why is it good to have a side loop like the hippocampus? Why is it good to have different programs running on the same hardware system, such as wake and, sip, uh, and sleep and so on? And you can say now with this, this complex system, is making the things much better for this brain. Yes, it does, because now, with all this complication, this machinery can predict the future a little bit better at a longer time scale and in a much noisier environment. But this is not cognition yet to my standards. Cognition arises when we disengage the brain from the rest of the world. This disengagement process allows you, or allows us to peek into the computation of the brain machinery and make, or allow us to make what if scenarios without acting out. What if I attend McGill? What if I offend University of Montreal? And so on and so on. And then play out in my mind the consequences of my, my potential choices and make a decision without that. But in order to do that, you have to calibrate the brain. Because action is an output. Thought is an output. Thought is a delayed action. There is no use for a thought whatsoever unless it will be useful sometimes in the future. Now, maybe this is a future for AI. You have to put it in an actuator and see what happens. And maybe when we work together, as Nancy very nicely and eloquently said, that we have to work together because there are many, many things that one discipline can inform the other, and it could be very useful in both directions. Now, let me give this is all talk, 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 talk. Let me give you some examples. This disengagement is also has another name called internalization. Remember, externalization, we build locomotives at AI. Internalization is the opposite thing, that we don't act out, we just think about things. So the hippocampus is famous about being the, the GPS of the hippo brain. This is what you could read in the first page of New York Times a couple of years ago. Uh, but it also, the structure that is kind of responsible for making us unique, making us individuals, because all the episodic memories, all our ep memory collections are made with the help of the hippocampus and as associated structures. So you can think about it different things, navigation, memory, planning, and so on. These are all different words. And as Joshua said, you know, the problem with words is that they are discrete, whereas uh, computation may not be like that. In, in, in my language, we say that Words are there to hide your thoughts. So that's uh, probably true in, the, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a metaphoric level here also. So initially, the hippocampus has worked out a mechanism, or nature worked out a mechanism, that the animal can navigate with the help of the outside clues. At one point, it was, became so smart that you no longer need the, the outside world, and you can navigate internally. And that internal navigation is, of course, called mental travel. That was 
the term and beautiful phrase that was introduced by Yo and Der Tulving, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago. And so this is mental travel. This is the disengagement from the world. You can go back to the past and then we call it memory. You can go into the future and we call it planning or imagination. Okay, so what is the neuroscience evidence for this? Navigation itself is supported by multiple type of computations in a landscape of dynamic systems. Now, there are at least three elements of this. When you come out from the subway, in the map in your hand, the first thing is to orient the map. And this is what the head direction system does. The second is to calibrate the environment around you. That's what the grid system do. And this, the third thing that you need is to locate yourself on the map. And this is what the place cells do. Not quite right, but just talk about this one. So what is guiding these neurons in the brain? When you can take one view, said, oh, they are responding to the outside world. And let's just start with the head direction system. The head direction system is that allows you to know which direction you are facing and when you change that there is a whole series of neurons that change their firing patterns as you turn your head. Now, of course it does because the, the bluish of the wall changes, the faces I see are changing, everything is changing. But the truth is when I close my eyes, my head direction is the same. And so Adrian Perash asked the important question, what happens with this presumably driven system when you close the eyes or you fall asleep? And the answer was not much in terms of you're looking inside the, the brain and you look at many neurons, then what you can see here, you know, there are many of my figures are very complicated. I'm sorry for that, but this is neuroscience. <laughs> and I don't find my pointer. So what you see here is that there are black lines. The, the, the black lines, they, they correspond to the reconstructed direction of the head from the neurons. And the, bled, uh, the, the red one is the real head direction. And you can see that correspondence is absolutely perfect. Not surprising because they are recorded from dozens of neurons. But the surprise thing is that happens when the animal falls asleep and you are in REM sleep. What I'm showing here, just believe me, the, the, the degree change, that is neurons that are representing the 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees that go in a ring, they are the same sequence when you are in REM sleep. In other words, we can tell which direction the animal is looking at while sleeping. During non-REM sleep, this change, we call it a ring, because it's a ring attractor, is exactly the same, but it goes around 10 times faster for a particular dynamic that we don't really understand, but it relates to many other the things. Now, this is just an illustration of what I said. There are neurons that are overlapping because they correspond to the 30 degrees and 35 degrees. No wonder they also overlap in time. And there are neurons that are representing the opposite direction. No wonder they are not correlated in time. So the question is that there is no correlation, there is good correlation, uh, a, a perfect correlation, where is the, the change? Where is the zero correlation? And it happens about six degrees. Now, in a moment, it be becomes a little bit important. But the point here is that if you look at the, the time calibration signal, this is the same pattern that you see three times, but the non-REM sleep or slow wave sleep is 10 times faster, okay? So just to summarize, this is a self-organized and intrinsically internally organized system. It can do a lot of things such as amplification, but it also can do interpolation. I can close my eyes and it's still there. And maybe extrapolation a little bit that when I turn my head, I can predict what comes next. Uh, it was just during sleep. And the chunks of 60 degrees is important because the grid system in the entorhinal cortex that you may heard about, the grid cells, they also have this organization. And if you destroy the head direction system, the grid system disappears. And Adrian's work gave rise to a barrage of papers by others and showed pretty much the same thing in the entorhinal cortex with grid cells that they persist during sleep, non-REM sleep, the, the dynamic is 10 times faster during non-REM sleep and so on. So now let's go to the second element, which is the, you know, we exhausted now the grid system, we exhausted the head direction system, let's try to have a look at the play cells. So play cells, 
identified by John O'Keefe. It's a beautiful name because they respond to when an animal is a particular part of the environment. Uh, it's an interesting problem. I became interested in this when I've seen this second discovery, namely that it's not only the neuron responds to a particular uh, part of the environment, but it's firing and its relationship to the external world is also related to an internal dynamic called hippocampal theta cycle. So the colors correspond to the theta phase. So this is your reference signal and, and relative to the reference signal, the precision where you are is better than if you're lumping everything together. Now, here is a problem. Theta oscillation is generated in here. The things out there are not in sync with this. So how do we get this precision? How is the, the relationship between the position of the animal and the spiking phase of the, the neurons remains put? There are two ways to think about it. The first way is that every single spike in the hippocampus is responding to some kind of input from the body or from the environment. With this thinking, we basically made the hippocampus an honorary V1, which responds to the outside world. The other way of thinking about it is that is all or most of it is internally generated. So let's test these two ideas. Good theories are good because they have explicit predictions. O'Keefe's mapping theory or navigation theory or cognition the cognitive mapping theory is fantastic because it has explicit prediction. Namely, if you freeze a rat here and now, there should be always a subset of cells that will fire forever as long as the animal is here. Whereas all the other neurons should be silent. If this is self-organized, things may be different. So you can make this test by training the animal to run in a wheel, in a working memory task, or spatial alternation task, where the task is, if you were rewarded on the right, go to the left, and in between there is a 15, 20 second delay. And somehow, somewhere, in this case the hippocampus, has to retain the information of the past in order to make actions in the future. So what we found is that uh, again, I don't have the pointer here, but you can see that there is color codes. Every single line is a neuron. There are many neurons there, and we can line up the neuronal firing rates one after the other in an arbitrary way, so it will be a beautiful track or trajectory of the animal's distance or time running in the wheel. And you can see that when the animal make a, a future left turn or a future right turn, the two patterns are fundamentally different. So. This is not about space now anymore. And show me one neuron where the firing is persistent throughout where the animal is. We found not one neuron which would be firing throughout the position because this was the here and now. Instead, what we find is that even in the wheel when the animal is running and the memory is driving the system, the lifetime of the neurons is pretty much the same when the animal is running around in the world. So perhaps the primary thing is a self-organized sequential activity system, a, a pattern that is generated, the brain just can't help. The brain is in eternal motion. You cannot freeze it. Therefore, it, this evolution is, is given, and that evolution can be assigned to various parts of the world. I, I don't have time here, but we show that, it, that if you have speed, which is available for the animal, and if you have the time or the distance, you can calculate the third one, and this is why there is a put relationship or fixed relationship between the animal's position and the spiking of the neurons at a particular phase of the theta cycle. Okay, so let's go back to the problem of the, 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 the conference, which is now we, 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 I try to make you believe that there is a fundamental brain dynamic that is necessary to maintain. And now we would like to relate it to what happens in the external world. And I would say this is the current thinking despite all of the smart people. But if you go to the Society for Neuroscience meeting and you ask people, you said, do you believe in tabula rasa in a blank slate? Nobody will say it. But all the experiments, or most of the experiments, are still designed according to this framework. And the interpretation of the, the data that we find is also within this framework. So there are historical reasons why it is like that. And the key words here is that the brain is organized in a, this is a random network. 
uh, it is egalitarian, that is, uh, there are equal numbers, there are, there have rules, you know, this is Canadian again. Uh, there is uh, the, the fashionable term is the excitatory inhibitory balance. Noise is always needed. Without the noise, none of the computational works do anything useful, but they never say anything about sleep. And the problem with this is that you build the system and you train the system, and you, the more you train, the more complex it becomes. And everybody knows it that when it, it, there are certain limits, and, and the curse of uh, computational neuroscientists, at least in the old days, was the uh, catastrophic interference, which all of a sudden makes the system collapse. My brain, your brain, will not have that problem because we maintain our dynamic, and the added information is tiny. It's, a, it's like a, 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 on a huge tsunami, learning is only a few droplets. So it doesn't matter how much I learn, my brain dynamic fundamentally will not change. The reason why this is dominant, I think, is because there were great people, like Alan Turing, who said exactly what I just said. Okay? And there are other great people, you know, such as John Hopfield, who said equivalent members. And neither of them has any merit. Instead, the alternative thing about this is there is an autonomous brain. The distributions are skewed, very strongly skewed, most of the time log normal. And sleep is essential no matter what we do. So the idea here is that we don't have to work a lot on a computational model or in a, a brain model to learn and with so much heavy and plasticity, one after the other, all the time. But we can have a block design, and I like Joshua's last, maybe the, the, the last slide of the first part, is that maybe there is a discrete modular system. The number of attractors are discrete. And this seems to be the case. It's, the brain is more like a, a legal system that you can adjust it in various ways, and then, uh, then uh, uh, plasticity is important, but it's not so important and not so overwhelming as we thought before. The bottom line, the take home message what I said so far and probably the, probably the entire talk is that we learned that neurons that fire together, wire together. I would like to put this upside down and say neurons that wire together, fire together. Okay. So instead of representationism, instead of believing that the brain is there to observe the beauty of the world and map what's outside, we can think about slightly differently, said, no, 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 there is a brain dynamic that is unique to humans, unique to a spider, unique to a bat, unique to all animals, and they try to make sense of the outside world with the dynamic that the, the brain provides. So where do we go from here? So if there is a dynamic and it affects us, that who we are and, and how we perceive the world, then there must be a rule. Now, physicists are very proud because they have tons of laws. Neuroscientists are also proud, but we don't have a lot of laws, but we have at least one. And there's a fundamental law is the Weber-Fechner law. That is never been violated, it's everywhere. It don't, is, is, is there anyone here who doesn't know what the wave effect on law is? Okay, so if, if I match a light here, you wouldn't notice it. But if I switch off the lights, all the lights off, the same amount of light, you will perceive it very easily. So the, your perception is proportional with the baseline of the excitation of the brain, okay? Now, this applies to short-term memory, this applies to time perception, to space perception, and many, many other things. So it is a fundamental law. It has to be supported by the brain dynamic. It's a, it's a log rule. And it turns out that almost everything in the brain is log normally distributed, which is a dynamical system. Now, these dynamical laws are based on a distribution of, of a structure, and the structural elements are also log normally distributed. For example, firing rates of the neurons, the burst probability, synaptic strength, axon conduction velocity, population synchrony, and so on. It means that 10% are as valuable 
than 90% when it comes to value or measure of performance. Now, the same is also applies. It doesn't matter whether you look at the connectivity at the macroscopic level or the single neuron level, the spine level, and so on. So here is an example. When you look at the spine sizes on a single pyramidal cell, the distribution is log normal. There are very few giant synapses, and most of them are, are tiny, tiny, and this is the distribution. Or if you look at the, uh, the other side, look at the synaptic size or the synaptic weight, and so on, it's the same thing. Or no matter where you go into the brain and you look at and tabulate the firing rate of many, many neurons, and you look at their distribution, there will be neurons that are very diligent, and these diligent neurons will be firing for 74 years or maybe 100 years forever at about the same rate and they are responsible for half of the performance of the brain it's a, it's a, it's a minority so you can record this neuron any neurons this is a hippocampal enteral cortex but in any species in any area including the anterior horn of the spinal cord in a turtle or hippocampal neurons or neocortical neurons so the, if it is very important, it has to be sustained by something. Now, what happens with this firing rates is that they are changing during the day. They are changing in an interesting way that the left hand and the right hand, that is the very low firing neurons, or mostly silenced neurons, and the very active neurons are getting faster and slower. So this log distribution is wider. But every night, there is a homeostatic mechanism that brings the back from the right and brings the back from the left. So the log bell curve becomes skewed. This is exactly what we would like to have in society. Now, our distributions of wealth and power and everything is skewed, but we don't have sleep. We have to have a sleep-like mechanism that will bring the distribution from left to right to the right way. OK, so I'd like to believe that these are not just statistical uh, curiosities, but they are fundamental for the brain function, which is we know that it's at the same time very robust, but super sensitive. And, and meeting these uh, competing environments requires enormous diversity. The enormous diversity is represented by not only component diversity, there's very types of interneurons, many types of pyramidal cells, but within the same type the distribution is skewed, log normal. So the same CA1 pyramidal cell, the CA uh, layer 5 pyramidal cell has this enormous firing rate distribution. So what are the sleeping cells do, those that don't really contribute much? Well, you can ask it in an interesting way because you can say maybe they are just there for reservoir, they have to make connections, we have to make heavy and conjunctions to them and then recruit them. Or the other way of, of thinking about it, they are already part of the network, they are already part of the attractor, they are just not tickled enough, therefore they don't spike. But in the laboratory we can tickle them. So when the animal is, is running in a, in a track, let's say, again you don't see what I wanted to show you, what you can see on the right, there is are four play cells. They increase their firing rate when the animal goes from one place to another in a sequence. And you can see a yellow cell, the lousy one there, that doesn't do anything. You cannot call it a play cell because it doesn't have a place. And that neuron is shown on the left, on your left up there. Now, we ask the same neuron now, there are actually two neurons, but I ask the, the neuron above, if I ask you, where would you fire if I make you fire? Then it turns out that it has a place field. It has a preferred place field, just like any other neurons. It's just sub-threshold. It doesn't express, it doesn't talk much, but it perceives enough, it gets information, it's part of the network. And it's not alone, because all the neurons that we recorded from, that the silent neurons, were already part of this giant attractor network, even when they're silent. So, where does all this come from? And it can come from experience, but as I already alluded to you, my brain is, and your brain will not change very much in terms of uh, statistical measures of connectivity, alpha power, theta power, and so on, if there is no experience whatsoever. So, if we can believe it, then most of these things should come from development, which is also internally organized. So in order to do that, we do an experiment, which is like this. You can take out 
the fetuses from the womb, zap the brain, put in a construct into neurons, and label them at different days before they are born. So you can have neurons that are labeled at embryonic day E15, 15, 16, and so on in different days. Now you just wait a few months, they are adults, and then you can ask the question, how do neurons that were born on the same day relate to each other compared to those neurons that were born on different days? Cell genesis is a big wave. There are, there's an enormous wave of many, many neurons born in a couple of days and, and a couple of weeks in, in humans. And, and then we would like to know how the system is brought together by simple rules. And indeed, what you can see here is that those neurons that are born early or later, they occupy different sublayers of this very single layer, which is very, very thin. You would never, I, you know, 20 years ago, nobody thought that the hippocampal CA1 layer is, 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 is sublayer rich, but it is, and it's determined by, by uh, uh, development. So now we can ask the very interesting question in the adult animal, namely that how those neurons, such as the light and red blue that were born on the same day relate to each other. And you can see that they represent the world if you want, but it's the other way around, you know, they match the internal uh, connectivity to the world and the place cells overlap. Whereas the red cell is born on a different day and it does something differently. And when you compare the two populations, they are very different. Okay, so this is all nice. Uh, I'm, I'm using the same thing as, as Nancy, you know, this is all very nice, but <laughs> so the, the but is that if you believe that maintaining the brain dynamic is expensive, how do you measure it and how expensive it is? So then you have to, to get the help of somebody else who is uh, now postdoc in Canada. So then ask the same question is that, well, if it is true that certain spikes, the slow spikes, cannot be used for, for transmitting information because there is no interval, or the interval is too large. There is no integrator on the postsynaptic side that would be perceiving the message because there is no message. So what happens to those spikes and how do they behave which are lousy single spikes? So what you see here is a log distribution of the, the firing rates of, of neurons in, uh, in, in the neocortex, but it could be anywhere. I think this is actually the hippocampus. And you will find that neurons have this sporadic firing and they have a fast firing. The fast firing ones are used for information transmission, but not alone, but with many other neurons. And you can see the stripes there. And also in the cartoon that neurons fire together. They form HEBS cell assemblies. This is the cooperative action of neurons that allow them to convey information and discharge the downstream neurons. Now, when neurons are firing individually, you can see that they are independent from each other. They have no cooperative action. Therefore, these are wasted spikes. But these wasted spikes cost, every spike costs 10 to the ninth ATP. So it's an enormous loss. And how many spikes are there that do that? And this was the real surprise. Doesn't matter where you look. Half of the spikes in your brain all the time are slow spikes. They are not used for information transmission, but for something else. I didn't mention that they can still discharge interneurons, so they can maintain the dynamic very effectively, but, but this is what they are useful. So, so far, we can say this is not okay. And this is spreading also to AI. The, the people believe that you know, we, can, we have to remove this model from our thinking. Uh, but the big question that we are debating today that does it have to be brain-like at all? There are many, many other solutions and, and very useful without uh, trying to mimic the brain or making a brain. So finally, perhaps the last link of the, the two different fields is that say, how do we train? How do we learn some new things? And how do we select what is important and what is not important? And how does the uh, machine does it. This is called the credit assignment problem. And of course, this is not a new idea. Extraordinary, I was raised up with this problem. We didn't call it credit assignment problem, we called it the, time, the temporal paradox. That is, how can the reinforcer reinforce something that happened earlier in time? In other words, what is the mechanism 
that allows from a stream of inputs that coming into the brain to select some that is important and put the rest into the trash can. And uh, these are the major players who, who, who uh, did this very nice work. What we have known for a long time, uh, partially from our own work, is that there is a pattern in the hippocampus called hippocampal sharp wave ripple. This is the key word of my talk, hippocampal sharp wave ripple. These are the, the most synchronous patterns in the mammalian brain. Many neurons come together. This is probably the ultimate and strongest attractor in the hippocampus and perhaps in the entire brain that allows spreading the, the information from the hippocampus, but also from upstream, it can bias the occurrence of these uh, events and select which attractor will be playing in each of these cycles. So what we have known is that it's very important because it is replayed three to 4,000 nights a night in humans. So you learn one thing while you are waking and snippets of this information are replayed in different fractions many, many, many times. So the hippocampus does a favor to you because it allows you that from one shot learning, you may remember things forever. Now, the, the key thing is that which things you will remember forever? How do you select? Now, so Nancy already showed some beautiful examples is that, that you know, what I'm showing here is, is uh, our new weapon. This is a electrode that allows us to see a panoramic view of what's happening around. This is uh, both sides are electrodes, not only one side. So we can record up to 500 neurons and then see how the activity describes what the animal does. And it's not a surprise. You can see here that there are, there are sequences of these activities, that the sequences of the activities correspond to where the animal is in the environment. It is just confirms what O'Keefe claimed all along. And when you look at these, they can say, uh -huh, they are pretty much the same. It is like somebody is saying the same sentence over and over and over again, the same sentence. But again, as, as Joshua said, if just one word in the sentence changes, then it changes the meaning. So it looks like these are pretty much the same, but if you look at closely, this is one word that changed. You can see that they didn't fire at the beginning of the session, it does fire at the, the end, and the, the whole repertoire is shown on the top. This other neuron, uh, it actually changes field representation, if you want. And the third one is just a good example that it was not there at the beginning and it was recruited to this sentence at the very end. Now, if you use those magical tools such as UMAP that is sensitive to the differences, such as, again, Nancy's uh, a CNN that shows that, oh, faces are different because these are so sensitive matters that it detects the change. And this UMAP detects the change. The question is what kind of change here? You, you see it on the right, every single uh, dot corresponds to a population vector, while we slide the measurements of the population vector every 100 milliseconds or so. And we ask what part of it, it corresponds to something. And you said, you've got this funny pattern. How does it relate to the real world? And then you go back and said, hmm, this is the maze. And it, you can see there is a resemblance and you can make the segments where the animal is, where the turns and so on, and you see a very nice correspondence. That's wonderful. But that's, that's predicted. What is the second question you can ask? Can you tell which trial the animal is in? The first trial, the middle trial, or 50 trials? Those of you who are swimmers, I swim, I always forget whether it was uh, the lap 15 or lap 25 because you have to count. Unless you count it, you, you, you don't really re remember it. Now, the hippocampus does the counting for you. It counts every single one of them because they are slightly different and that difference makes it interesting. Now, this is fine. But this is nothing more than, and perhaps nothing less than, Nancy's face recognition program. It sensitizes very effectively and says, hmm, yeah, different, 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 different. We, we, we realize that. And then, again, we celebrate because the, the, the CNN does the same job. 
Therefore, there must be a similarity. But who cares? The brain should care. Do we know that the brain actually utilizes this information? Now we can ask the real question is that when the animal ends the journey and is rewarded, and then the brain state changes from this theta state to the sharp wave ripple state, which spikes will be replayed? Okay. And the answer is that if a ripple occurs, the ripple sometimes occurs, sometimes don't occur. If a ripple occurs, what trial is being replayed? And the answer is most of the time, the trial that the ripple occurred within, that is the last one, is registered. And uh, you can see here the, the, from the diagonal. Now, if you look at the distribution of ripples from after each brain state change, so the reward is not doing anything. It gives the affordance for the brain to change from one brain state to another one. And then you can count the number of sharp wave ripples. So, for example, here the first trial, there's nothing. Second, third trial, only one. And then somewhere in, at the end, there are many, many, many of them. Now, we would like to know what happens next. How is the brain exploits this selection process? And so I say, okay, now we have this sequence that happens during waking. It's, it's unique for every single trial. You can read it out from the waking ripples. Now you put the animal back to the home cage and there are thousands of sharp waves one after the other. They are replaying something. What do they replay? The answer is what they replay is what the waking replay labeled. The re waking replay selected something. The reason why I know that is because I know the distribution here after each uh, lap, what happened, how many sharp waves, and what was the content during waking and during sleep, and this is quite similar, and you do it for the entire database, and you can, what did you say, 0 0.9 was a fantastic number, this is almost there, <laughs> it's an extraordinary good match, that is, there is a selector mechanism here, and that memory selection is doing the thing for us, this is the credit assignment, and the Whatever conditions bring about this, sharp waves are the final arbitrators, arbiters, whether a, 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 a thing will, remembered, will be remembered or not. So to summarize, the brain is a spaghetti. <laughs> it, it comes with a lot of pre-existing dynamics. They are available reservoirs to be matched with the world. And these Legos can be exchanged very effectively by traffic lights, which are the inhibitory interneurons. So unlike, unless, well, unlike the, the, the tabula rasa idea that you have to put into the brain a lot of things that associate and, uh, and, and, and learn all the time, the brain is a pre-configured collection of things, you know, maybe Chinese characters that we don't understand. We have to anchor it. We have to ground them. And once we learn what is the meaning of a Chinese character, then we have a meaning that associated with this. So it's more like a selection process. And, uh, and this is the other alternative to the current brain model. And maybe this is a task and uh, AI can do something like this that would require less plasticity, less time, and perhaps higher efficacy. And if you are interested more, then I recommend this book. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. One question, like we did for the others, if there's this one burning question, and then we're going to uh, um, shift to the panel discussion. You want to keep your questions for the panel discussion? That's also fine. No. Oh, there's a question? Oh, Irina. Yes. Thank you for an amazing talk. Um, yeah, I read both books <laughs> as well. Uh, the question that you asked in the middle but maybe we don't need to copy brain to get to kind of- We don't need what kind of? To make a copy of how brain uh, achieved its intelligence. Um, there are other ways to achieve it, or well, the question is what level of intelligence to achieve. So basically, uh, um, I, I agree with the point that action and 
um, kind of embodiment are important for natural intelligence. I mean, that's how things are. The question is, do they have to be this way if the intelligence is artificial? Basically, it's kind of open question. Would it really hurt not to have embodiment? Uh, can we, well, we probably cannot prove that it will reduce the potential set of capabilities drastically. So basically, we don't know about, like, say, set of uh, possible capabilities with and without embodiment, right? To what extent it's truly needed, to what extent actions are truly needed to achieve intelligence. One thing we know for sure, and we always had this discussion with Paul, in real intelligence, no question about that. Without action, even those kittens and whatever kind of the newborn kittens without moving, seeing everything, cannot develop their intelligence properly. But with artificial intelligence, if hypothetically you will manage to give to sufficiently large artificial network, sufficiently diverse representation of distribution of things in the world. So the question is, maybe can, can enough? the question is that, do we need action? My answer is Do we need action? absolutely yes. I, I bet you 25 Canadian <laughs> quarter <laughs> that I, a human brain would never see, never hear, never had a thought without the ability to move. Yes. Now, once My it's calibrated, we have, we have done an experiment showing this, you know, how the body map is developing. How, does, how do I know that my, my body is a football or a snake or the way elegantly look, I look? So it has to be calibrated and the calibration changes daily when you are a newborn and so on. So this is, without action, nothing like this happens. Yeah. So the short answer is that I put the money on action and even if I'm not right, I offer an alternative thinking how you can approach brain science and perhaps AI uh, in the future and a different window will provide you different answers. I totally agree, yeah, about natural intelligence. I'm still not sure. I mean, this is sufficient, but maybe not necessary condition in... Not in my world. In AI world. Not but in the neural world. The AI world has an important ingredient that's called the human. Not for long. Forever. 